Uh, it's, it's so awesome to hear this story, Bill. It's just amazing. Um, you know, how many people in here are working on a social enterprise project right now? Here we go. Okay. How many people are investors in this space? Nice. Okay. So um, I just want to say that Bill is um, was one of our very first uh, social investors into uh, the Center for Social Innovation. Uh, he was an incredible risk taker and leader, and him backing us was one of the most important things that's ever happened to the development of CSI. So I just honor and celebrate, but I also want to say this. Uh, he's not a social entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. He's something greater. He's a social innovator. Good. And the difference is that a social innovator is focused on systems change. He went from being a social entrepreneur and trying to create a business model that would have return. And he realized that the real problem was the system. And he's focused on changing the system. And that's what this field is actually about. So make no doubts uh, about it. The objective is not to run a successful business. The objective is to be able to have an impact in the world. And so the question for you and each of you, and you're running your own businesses, and yes, of course, you're thinking about your own revenue streams and business models and capital investment and venture this and that and all this kind of stuff, and we love that it's in the portfolio of economic development. Do not get me wrong. It is absolutely essential that it be successful as a driver of our economy. But the end game is not the business itself. The end game in this field is the impact that that initiative can have. Okay, I made my piece. So I just wanted to start with that. Um, because I think it's really important. I've been watching. I remember Bill gave me that first meeting, and now, you know, for years now, nine, ten years, Bill and I, like, refer people back and forth. No, you meet with Bill. No, you meet with Tony. You meet with Bill. And Allison, and there, and we're all in this hilarious thing. And, um, you know, watching the story and the evolution of the field and the sector uh, is, an, is an important one. And the move to impact is the one that I keep coming back to in my own path. Okay, so I'm watching my time, she says. I'm way faster talking. Time is apparently <laughs> <lost> irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to go Thanks. with that. You know what, I say what we lose in timekeeping, we make up for in an day. And, 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 and knowledge. And knowledge. So let's just try this. We're all, so, we're all good. Um, so uh, the Center for Social Innovation, who are we, where do we come from? And we're maybe more um, of a traditional, I don't know if there can be ever using that word with me, but uh, we're a social enterprise. We are a revenue generating nonprofit organization. We are independent. We have been from the very inception, and our business model is based in the real estate field. So I'm trying to, how many people are from business sector? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, not as many as I thought, actually. Interesting. OK, I can talk about philosophy then, shall I? <laughs> 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 so look, I'm a serial social entrepreneur. I'm on my 17th social startup. This is uh, what I've always done. I don't know anything else. I come from an environmental background. And uh, I did my degree in environmental studies at U of T. And um, the organization that I co-founded before this was the organization that got the ban on bisphenol A in baby bottles. So I'm obsessed with systems change. I'm obsessed with policy. It's one of the reasons why I was a co-founder of the Ontario Nonprofit Network and worked with Helen and our work with the Partnership Forum and so on and so forth. And there comes, there's this thing here, and one of the questions that we'll get into if we ever get to those questions is around nonprofit, for-profit. Thinking about that is changing rapidly and quickly. But so what are we? We are a little nonprofit organization that had a really simple idea. I've been working in the nonprofit sector for years and years and years, and we had this question: What would happen if we shared? Hmm. What would happen if we shared photocopiers, fax machines, meeting room space? What happen? What would happen if around the coffee maker, people actually started to talk about their work across sectors? What would happen if arts organizations learned about the environmental movement and social justice organizations learned about the connections to environmental toxics? What would happen if we were to build communities and ecosystems that were aligned around social values? What would happen if we could actually get these folks who wanted to do good but were largely dysfunctional and ineffective? I'm sorry, but I've been in the field for a long time and I'm just going to put it out there. <laughs> they're largely not changing the world, but wanted to. 
What would happen if we actually started to remove the barriers to help these organizations to be more successful and more impactful? So we had some theories, some theories of change, if you will. We believed that if we could harness the power of entrepreneurship to address social problems, that this would be a remarkable movement. We believed fundamentally in the power of collaboration to get beyond those silos to be able to actually start working together. Because our sense was if we can't figure out how to work together amongst ourselves, how in God's name are we going to actually influence policy and make change in the world? So we sort of believed you had to get it together here first. And then how do we bring that lens, that systems changing lens, that relentless pursuit of impact, which is epitomized best in Bill's story. The drive for the impact is the most important. How do we bring that and, and push that forward? So those were, that was the sort of deep philosophical section. So I'm going to do the business model part now. So what we did is we started with 5,000 square feet. We partnered with an incredible real estate partner, Mar Margie Zeidler. We got 14 founding members and we got groups from environment, social justice, health, education, brought them all together and we shared office space. <laughs> wow, that's breakthrough. <laughs> so then what we did is we know that we had an economy to scale business. So what we did is we jumped to 23,000 square feet and 175 social mission organizations in a shared space and we leveraged the energy of social and entrepreneurship. How many people have been to a CSI space? Oh, that makes me happy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. If you haven't been, please come. It'll be fun. Coffee's really good at the CSIMs. Um, and then we had this crazy idea. That was 2007, we jumped in. 2010, I, I just had this real estate bug, and if you know me, I've also got this like design thing, like I really love building things. And, um, and so what happened is I fell in love with the building. We fell in love with the building at the corner of Bathurst and Bloor. So here's an interesting story for you finance guys. What do we do? Well, we had $50,000 in reserve funding. <laughs> Yay. Trillium would have loved us. Like, hey, look, you got a little reserve fund. Well done. And I looked at a building that was $4.5 million. I said, I want that building. <laughs> and then what happened was I said, OK, well, wait, if we get the building, I'm going to put another few million dollars in to get it up and running. We feel like we've got enough demand. Enough people want to have access to the office space. We'll do it. Well, how does a little nonprofit organization with a really good idea, but not a single asset to their name. How do you buy a $6.8 million bill? Well, the first second call you make is to build mm. But <laughs> what we did is we were able to bring together and turn our social capital, our community capital, into financial capital. And we created a tool called the Community Bond. The Community Bond is a social finance tool that enables unaccredited investors to be able to put their money where their mouth is and to be able to support meaningful projects that have revenue return potential. And what we did is we started with a loan guarantee from our very dear friends at the City of Toronto. We took that loan guarantee from the Economic Development Department at the City. We took that to the banks. We shopped it around to different uh, financial institutions and we ended up signing a mortgage with Alterna Credit Union. And we still had to raise this $2 million. And so what we did is we basically, I knocked on more doors in the shortest period of time you can possibly imagine. And we were able to raise with the incredible support of about 20 founding social investors at that stage, $1.4 million in under three months. We closed in the deal. We then raised the subsequent investment, the 600,000 by the end of the next RRSP season. We had created an RRSP eligible investment that was open to anybody who was willing to invest from their RRSP for a minimum of $10,000. We had a tranche system, a 15 year, 10 year, five year investment. It was quite complicated. You can read about it on the website. But let me just say, we did something which was we took the power of social capital and we turned it into financial capital. We had the power of momentum and the power of real estate. Let's be frank, it was a building. That building, just how many investors are in the room, I know Bill is, the building just got valued at 9.4 million, we're doing fine. So, what's interesting here is we had a really, really interesting process to become a for-profit, a non-profit, I can get into that later on. What's super important is that within Six months of taking possession of that building, we had opened up that space to an additional 150 organizations that were working on social change. We were facilitating our mission by removing barriers, providing access to small and emerging social enterprises, social entrepreneurs. We are now home to over 550 organizations and over 1,300 social entrepreneurs throughout our four, now four spaces. Anyway, long story short, 
2010, we bought the building. It was the craziest thing I'd ever done until we decided to move to New York, which was definitely the craziest thing we've ever done. Because what happened was, we got approached about a year and a half ago, and they said, hey, guys, um, we'd like you to open up a space in New York City. And we promptly said, no, thank you. We're getting really good at saying no. That's our new mission. <laughs> say no, say no, say no. And it was a typical New Yorker, a guy named Dave Geis, who said, look, my friend's in the real estate business. I'm going to make you a deal you can't refuse. And sure enough, he did. He did make a deal. It was so fun. And so now, of course, we are uh, in May. Uh, just this a couple months ago, we opened up the doors to 24,000 square feet of space, and we now have over 130 social entrepreneurs in New York City that made their home in uh, in our space. It's been the craziest year ever. I've never received more no's than I've received in the last 18 months. I didn't get a single US financial investor to be able to support our New York initiative. I'd received no from traditional funders like never before. We launched two new locations. We launched three new product lines. We merged two organizations. And we actually killed two product lines all within the last 10 months. I've never experienced more cash flow crazy year in my entire life. So if you think this whole field of social entrepreneurship is like easy, all I'm going to say to you is think and think and think again. This is a brutally challenging sector to be a part of. You need the power of all of the economic will and might that you can muster from traditional business sector, but you need something more important. You need your values to be able to help you make smart choices because there will be compromises at every turn. And how you make those decisions will determine whether you're a social innovator or a greenwasher. And I got to tell you, in this field, I've been watching it for nearly a decade right now, and there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of talk about a lot of big words that are supposed to be really new and exciting, and everybody's super happy and fun, 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 and let's jump on the bandwagon. But if I had a social entrepreneur with a good business idea for every person who wanted to support a social entrepreneur with a good business idea, we'd be a much stronger and robust province. And this is true across the board. This is not unique to Toronto or Ontario. It's just that there's a lot of interest in the field and not enough risk taking. Not enough people who are really bringing their thinking caps and the power of business and the power of good ideas and the power of those values to develop new business models that will actually change the world. <coughs> so, a little bit of self-serving stuff. So we've gone through intense, intense growth. And I have to tell you, I think I have to live every pain myself to truly embrace every one of these steps. It's like a, it's a bit of a nightmare. But um, we've had to go internal and really focus. So 500 organizations, massive growth. What do we do? How do we, how do we really fulfill our bigger mission, which is to catalyze social innovation? And so a lot of our work has been focused on how we are taking the power of our membership and moving to impact. Everything that CSI is doing right now is really focused on how we're unleashing the potential of our incredible members. And so I just want to tell you a few things that we're up to. Helen, in uh, incredibly exciting partnership that we've partnered with, um, social capital partners, we heard the whole list with Catapult. We're super excited to be able to make concrete investments, loans, into, well, we'll be hearing them on uh, Thursday. So if you're interested to come down to the Center for Social Innovation Annex, and we'll be hearing presentations and pitches from six. They've been vetted from about 55 loan applications. We'll be investing in three or four of them. We're not exactly sure. Depends how far the money goes. Uh, to be able to support and see the next step of development and growth for these young social entrepreneurs. So super excited to be actually able to offer a real concrete investment, finally, like real teeth into something real, um, uh, as a way to help support these incredible initiatives. Another project that we're really, really excited about and, and very proud of our work is that we were um, uh, proud to partner with Hivewire on the launch of a social entrepreneurship or social innovation focused crowdfunding platform. So you can check out CSI Catalyst. Anybody who's got a social mission project can join. We're really, really delighted. We've raised now tens of thousands of dollars for projects that have been made their home at the Center for Social Innovation, leveraging the power of the crowd to be able to support this work. The uh, other thing that we've done is some of the folks in here is we've started a, um, 
we have formalized what has been an informal program for several years called the Agents of Change program, which is an acceleration <coughs> program to support um, early stage entrepreneurs uh, to be able to get their projects through an education program, get concrete support. So whether you're a mentor or a young social entrepreneur, you're interested in accelerating a really, really focused impact investment project, uh, give us a call. And then finally, I'm just going to say, um, you know, uh, we welcome anybody, uh, anybody who's got a social mission to become a part of the Center for Social Innovation. With three locations in Toronto and one in New York, uh, it's a warm, welcoming environment. And whether you're older, young, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're new <coughs> to the field or really seasoned, we're really interested in how we're building the social cohesion and the social capital amongst people who want to change the world because we really do believe in these core values of collaboration, the power of social entrepreneurship with that focus, that unrelenting focus on social change. So that's the Center for Social Innovation. My journey is that, I'll just tell you, Jeff, I had the craziest year you might have heard. I just had a vacation. It was awesome. It was just awesome. Who did you build? Yeah, no, nothing. I fought some snakes and bears up at the cottage. It was really rough. But, um, but I'm back with some really, really exciting projects that we're looking to to the future. One of them is actually a really serious threat, and I want to raise it to you. How many people are bankers here in the room that come from the banking sector? Darn. Okay, so Lalit, we've got to do something. I get some bankers here. So it's interesting. You know, we created this community bond. We're offering a 4% flat rate return to community bondholders, five-year investment, minimum $10,000. And recently, the Canadian guaranteed by the city of Toronto. Guaranteed by the value of my bank, of my building. So it's a pretty solid 4% flat rate return. And the banking industry has unilaterally, as far as we can tell, decided to discontinue the RSP eligibility aspect of this. So I raise this because one of the things that we're really interested in is the power of citizens to be a part of the solution. It's wonderful that the uh, business sector wants in this space and it's it's critically important that we leverage that scale to be able to support this movement. But it's also about the power of citizens to bring agency and choice to their investments and how they spend their money and how they are able to create change in their own communities. Crowdfunding is a simply an extension of the work that we did with community bonds. It's about the democratization of social change. We know that government's not going to make all these changes. We know that the business sector is not going to make all these changes. We have to work together. And the power of the citizen voice to be a part of that is critical. So what we're seeing with the banking industry, which scares me and where I'm going to be putting a lot of my energy in the fall, is that looking at how do we educate the banking industry to see the potential and the power of RSP and unaccredited investments, uh, investors to be a part of this movement and a part of this solution. So I, I put that out there because I'm always looking for allies to be able to help us to build that, uh, to build that case. And then the second thing that I'll be spending too, too much time on is really looking at how do we support our members and our, our, our uh, these early stage organizations to really, truly embody the power of, um, uh, to embrace the power of data and metrics in their life. So this is a really tough area that uh, we're going to be struggling with, and you'll see this as we go through this nonprofit, for-profit question. How do we actually know whether we're having any impact at all? Are we just, if we're just job creation, that's fine. Like, good, go for it. If this is just a new vertical as a part of economic development, like, okay, cool, let's do it. But if we actually want to measure our true impact, we're going to have to really get our heads around this field of data and metrics, it's super duper hard. And I've been scared for years of it, and that's what's going to scare me and keep me awake in the next few years. So there you go. Awesome. Thank you.